Go within to find the answers you seek. About Hugh, a memoir in living color, written and narrated by Elaine Marie Sharp. Episode 2 As the Colors Turn. Flags and fireworks forever. My father used to get a real kick out of blasting stars and stripes forever on the stereo. He would turn the volume up so high that the living room would tremble, and you could swear the Thunderbirds were flying directly overhead. I'm sure the neighbors weren't thrilled, but no one ever complained, and I doubt Dad would have cared anyway. When you're a war veteran, you've already sacrificed enough for your country without having to turn down the volume, too. To this day, I'm a big John Philip Sousa fan, and I particularly enjoy Fourth of July concerts, where Sousa's patriotic marching music is as standard as White Christmas in December. I spent many years in Boston and, like most people I knew, looked forward to the all-day excursion to the Esplanade, where we would eat, drink, and listen to the Boston Pops, then conducted by the great Arthur Fiedler. There's nothing like a steamy, hot Independence Day celebration along the Charles River, hanging out with a sea of sweaty strangers throwing frisbees. But the heat and mosquitoes were well worth it, for after the long day, we were rewarded with that wonderful orchestra. And then the big finale would come, Stars and Stripes Forever, and soon everyone was dancing and clapping and waving their small flags. By nightfall, we would become part of the dark indigo sky, a dramatic backdrop for the booming, electrifying performance of gold, red, green, blue, white, and purple. I've seen some truly spectacular fireworks in my lifetime, whether viewed from a 72-foot schooner in the middle of Newport Harbor or while sprawled on a lawn near the White House or St. Louis Arch. The colors are always fantastic, ooh, and always, always magical, ah. And even if your celebration takes place at a friend's backyard barbecue, where the light show is nothing more than a few Roman candles and a sparkler on a cupcake, there's still something to ooh and ah about. It is the last week of June, and flag fever is rampant. Replicas of the stars and stripes are hanging from buildings, lampposts, trees, cars, baby strollers, and atop sandcastles on the beach. I find it interesting that the Continental Congress never did give an explanation as to how we got the flag colors of red, white, and blue, but President George Washington gave his own interpretation. We take the stars from heaven, the red from our mother country, separating it by white stripes, thus showing that we have separated from her, and the white stripes shall go down to posterity, representing liberty. I was attending Dwight Avenue Junior High School in San Antonio, Texas, when I first heard the comedian Red Skelton's stirring monologue about the Pledge of Allegiance. Our principal played the recording over the loudspeaker, afterward announcing that there would be a school-wide essay contest about patriotism and what the Pledge of Allegiance meant to us. I Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, 
with liberty and justice for all. I had grown up reciting that pledge, and whenever I placed my hand over my heart, looking up at the red, white, and blue, I didn't see just a pretty piece of cloth. I saw my history. I saw my legacy. I don't recall the exact words I wrote, but Red Skelton's words inspired me so much that I actually won that writing contest. Soon after, I received a letter of congratulations from Red Skelton himself, which was exciting because I enjoyed his weekly television show, especially when he was performing as Clem Cadiddlehopper or the two seagulls, Gertrude and Heathcliff. That used to crack me up. Dad was a Vietnam War vet who received a military funeral with a three-gun salute, a flag-draped coffin, and the playing of Taps, one of the saddest songs I've ever heard. When I look at Old Glory waving from the many houses around us, I will see red for courage, white for hope, and blue for the freedom of speech that I am so grateful to have as a writer. And I always think of Dad, of course. Granted, not everyone feels pride when they see the colors. In fact, some people are so angry these days that they are seeing red. But no matter how you feel about the state of our nation, there is surely one thing we can agree upon. The good old U.S. of A. knows how to throw one hell of a birthday party. Kaleidoscope Eyes Boyfriend handed me a small piece of paper and told me to eat it. Say what? I thought you wanted to trip out. Isn't that what you told me? He was clearly annoyed, his eyes bulging like a constipated frog. I nodded, examining the blank paper. Where's the acid? Don't worry about it, he snapped. Trust me, it's there. Just shove the whole thing in your mouth and eat it. I couldn't remember the last time I had eaten paper, not even as a curious child, but that's what I was being ordered to do in that dreary Cape Cod cabin in the woods. I was living outside of Hyannis with my abusive Irish-American boyfriend, whom I planned on running away from just as soon as I could manage to find a secret hideaway for my twenty-something self and Duke, my trusty black Labrador. But that much-anticipated escape would have to be postponed, I was going on a different kind of trip, ideally to psychedelic nirvana. Getting high wasn't a foreign concept to me. Before I had met boyfriend, I had practically lived in Boston discos where I had smoked pot, snorted cocaine, even swallowed an occasional black beauty or Christmas tree. But acid would be my first hallucinogenic, and I was wary. What about the flashbacks? I asked remembering a particularly graphic movie I was forced to watch in high school. Damn it, would you just eat the stuff? Nothing bad's going to happen to you. I've done this hundreds of times, and I'm still here. In all your abusive glory. So I chewed, and chewed, and chewed. Only I couldn't swallow it. I tried again, but it just stuck there in the back of my throat until I gagged. Drink this, he commanded, handing me a bottle of Heineken. He only drank Heineken, insisting it was the true king of beers. But I hate beer, I choked. He gave me that look, and so I chugged the amber water until I burped. The paper was still there. It took another half a bottle before I finally managed to swallow the darn thing. Okay, now what? My personal LSD guide from hell dimmed the lights and sat in his chair in front of the television to watch the A-team. I sat near him on the carpet, half watching the screen, anxious for my magical mystery trip to begin. Enter Mr. T. As soon as the gruff actor with the mohawk and golden chains appeared, I laughed. Every time he spoke, he was hysterical 
and it wasn't long before I was literally rolling on the floor with laughter. I could feel the vibrations of every sound in that room shoot through my body. In fact, all my senses had heightened. When Boyfriend played Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds on the stereo, I was so stimulated that I thought I was going to fly and crash through the roof. After we had incredible acid sex, I began exploring my surroundings, amazed at every lamp, every cushion, every breathing door and doorknob. Day had suddenly turned into evening, and I toddled outside to view the night sky. What a light show! The stars were bright, enormous beings that beckoned me to swing on them. Colors were intense, too. Once I had to go to the bathroom, and I sat there for what may have been hours, staring at the breathing blue, green, and pink flowers on the faded wallpaper. Fascinated, I looked at my hands, pulsating with bright red blood flowing through blue-green veins. When I finally left the bathroom, I wasn't even sure if I had urinated, (laughs) I made my way to the bedroom. By that time, Pink Floyd's Is There Anybody Out There was blasting at full volume, and I collapsed on the bed. When I rolled over, I looked up at the ceiling and saw the apocalypse. Wow, it's like watching an old movie or newsreel, except it's in color, I narrated. I see thousands of screaming people running in fear. Boyfriend had joined me on the bed. Stop, don't tell me anymore, he sniffed. What what you're describing is the end of the world, and I don't want to know about it. I continued to watch the ceiling cinema, until the colors collided into one huge water splash, and I fell asleep. The next morning, I felt horrible, (laughs) like a fleet of trucks had plowed over me and back again. I could barely lift my head, let alone my arms and legs. When I was finally able to walk, I stumbled into the living room. What a mess! Chairs and lamps were overturned, drinks had spilled, the television was still on. Boyfriend had left the bed and sat snoring in his favorite flea market chair. Duke came over to me, nudging for a pat, which I happily obliged. That dog was the only thing I loved in the entire rotten place. We're getting out of this hellhole, boy, I promised, grateful that boyfriend was still slumped in his chair. And you know what? I'll be damned if I'm the one who has to clean up this dump. Opening the Heart with Pink A rose quartz crystal is vibrating in my hand. It is the shade of a soft petal pink, and its gentle energy helps me prepare for the color ascension, awakening to the color pink teleseminar I'll be teaching tonight. Of all the colors that exist, I believe that every being on the planet needs pink, a color prized for its attributes of self-love and compassion. I was not raised to be compassionate. If I fell off my bike and skinned my knee, no one offered to help me up or say, I'm sorry you hurt yourself. Instead, I got remarks like, oh, that didn't hurt, or stop crying, or I'll give you something to cry about. Not growing up in a huggy, kissy family, I used to cringe when strangers hugged me, even in church so I was unprepared for the onslaught of love I received when I accompanied my good friend Tom to an Opening the Heart workshop in Ashby, Massachusetts. It was the late 70s. Tom had just joined the singing group on Wings of Song 
and they were meeting in a huge farmhouse on Spring Hill. I knew we were going to spend the night there, but I didn't know what else to expect. And I certainly had no clue that everyone would be hugging and smiling and singing, (laughs) sleeping on the great wooden floor next to each other. Except for Tom, they were all strangers to me, and I had no idea how to react, bristling every time someone hugged me. The founder of the singing group was Robert Gass. I remember how loving he was, beaming with an extraordinary pink light. Everyone I met was kind, but I still felt strange, embarrassed. I just wasn't ready for so much unconditional love, and I certainly didn't know how to express it. As strange as this experience was, I couldn't deny that Spring Hill had great vibes. I loved the knotty pine floors and beams and the sunshine streaming through the huge glass windows. We spent most of the time on the second floor, which had a panoramic view of rolling hills. The acoustics in the building were astounding, and the singing voices were ethereal. It was the first time music had ever vibrated right through me, and I found it both frightening and exciting. It's been said that timing is everything. While Tom was joyfully opening his heart, I was just as adamant about shielding mine. Up to that point, real love had always included physical intimacy, so it scared me to be around people who expressed love in a completely different way. I didn't believe I was worthy of that kind of love. Spring Hill was my first taste of opening the heart. In hindsight, it is a shame that Tom and I weren't on the same page at the time because I think he would have been a fabulous spiritual teacher. I wonder what he would think of me now. (laughs) For the past 30 years or so, I have been working on self-love and forgiveness, being grateful for the life I have, and not dwelling on things I don't have. Oh, and I've been opening my heart chakra too. I purchased a heart chakra crystal singing bowl. I practice color meditation on a daily basis and work with rose quartz, morganite, and other pink gemstones to improve my self-love. I bless everything, even my enemies, and I have come to understand that certain family members are among my greatest teachers. In my book, In the Cash, A Journey to the Realm of Oneness, Elm Sunday yearns to become a pinky, a soul who has successfully completed all the tasks of the pink level. There are seven different color levels, pink, blue, gold, green, yellow, white, and violet. The book focuses on Elm's learning how to love and to forgive, to release her anger and fears. I wasn't ready to embrace the joyful love Tom found in Ashby, but I am grateful for the brief time we spent together because he was a very special soul. Sadly, we lost touch not long after my Spring Hill experience, and I only learned recently that he died from Alzheimer's. He was truly a wonderful man, and I was happy to learn that he married a wonderful woman. Have fun singing with the angels, Tom, and enjoy this great pink bunny hug of love and light. More white stuff. Nick looked at me as if I had grown three heads and a tail. We were sitting at the dining table, and I was frustrated, trying to describe the disappointing flavor of the rice cake before me. Unless you spread something on it like almond butter, it pretty much tastes like... I searched for the word. Like, um... Nothing. Nick tried to help. Like what? I stared at the rice cake, hoping the word would magically appear on its crunchy top, flashing like a neon sign, except written in edible ink. You know, that white stuff. What white stuff? Nick was really trying here. (laughs) Um, well, that white stuff. 
you know, y- you put it in boxes, I stammered. Boxes? Nick clearly would win the Most Patient Husband of the Year award. I was getting nowhere fast. Yes, that white stuff, you you know, that stuff you, you use to protect things. But it's bad for the environment. That stuff. Tissue paper? No. Nick's frown indicated he was weary of my silly word game, but he offered one more possibility. You mean styrofoam? It took me a few seconds before my brain caught up. Yes, that's it! Wow, another brain fritz. Thank you, Mr. Lyme Disease Tick. Besides styrofoam, there's another kind of white stuff that I've had strong feelings about. Last week on Groundhog's Day, Punxsutawney Phil emerged to see his shadow and scurried back into his lair. He's rarely accurate with his weather predictions, so I sensed that we were definitely in store for another six weeks of the dreaded white stuff, also known as snow. I've had a love-hate relationship with snow. I loved sledding and building igloos when I was a kid. I love it at Christmas time. But my maternal grandfather died shoveling the snow, and I haven't forgotten that. When you live in the Northeast during winter, you have to expect an occasional dumping of snow, although sometimes you get more than you bargained for. Nick was visiting his mother in England when a blizzard made its path to Rhode Island. One night I was sitting at my computer when I heard an explosion. It was dark outside and I couldn't see anything, so I finished what I was doing and went to bed. The next morning, I couldn't believe what had happened. One of our tallest pine trees had fallen in the backyard. It was blocking our back door, and the top of the tree was against our floor-to-ceiling dining room window. Fortunately, it wasn't broken. Subsequently, the power went out, and the house turned cold. Arctic cold. I spent the next 24 hours feeding logs and paper in the fireplace as our concerned kitties, Tim and Holly, huddled close. Everything felt like ice in our house, even the frosty quilts and blankets. For nearly a week, there was no nick, no power, and very little sound. It was as if the snow had smothered the universe. Had I been in a more reflective mood, I might have enjoyed seeing the sunny glint on the sparkling white snow or the birds pecking for seeds from the swinging bird feeders. Last January, as I watched the falling snowflakes through my home office window, I noticed a red cardinal in a nearby tree and was struck by how much brighter he appeared against the marshmallow whiteness of our backyard. Seeing this reminded me of something the great artist Leonardo da Vinci once said. For those colors which you wish to be beautiful, always first prepare a pure white ground. Big Smiles for Little Magenta During a sudden bout of Bell's palsy in 2003, I was able to test my theory that a traumatized body knows exactly which color it needs to recuperate. Despite my doctor's skepticism, I sought alternative healing methods for relief. Since Bell's palsy is brain-related, I decided to strengthen my crown chakra by wearing violet color therapy glasses and breathing violet for a few minutes each day. Additionally, I listened to meditation tapes, drank bottles of rescue remedy, and slept with a piece of chrysoprase, a pretty pale green healing stone, under my pillow. 
I also smeared my face with so much of Arasoma's dark magenta-colored physical rescue that I looked like a bruised and bloody accident victim. More annoying than painful, I was almost getting used to the constant drooling and inability to speak. I longed to accelerate my recovery, so I doused myself in green light, the traditional color of healing. I thought green would do the trick, but apparently my body knew better. I found myself craving the color magenta. But why magenta, I wondered, for surely this striking red-violet color was never a personal favorite. I did a bit of research and discovered that magenta aids those with neurological problems like Bell's palsy. In Arasoma, magenta is about divine love and understanding the value in little things. Well, the one little thing that was most sacred to me, other than my marriage, was my smile. Oh, how I missed it. Two days after I left the hospital, I was supervising a kid filmmaker summer camp. With a crying right eye, a winking left eye, and the right side of my mouth completely numb and drooping like a basset hound, I was embarrassed to be seen in public. Nevertheless, I was the executive director and I had a job to do. On the first day, we always watched movies from the previous year's summer camps, and then the kids got familiar with the video equipment by interviewing each other. One nine-year-old girl refused to be on camera. There was no way she was going to do it, she said. That's when a light bulb went off in my frazzled brain. I asked her if she would like to interview me. Well, the girl looked at me as if I was crazy, probably wondering how I even had the nerve to be filmed considering how hideous I looked. Then the dark clouds parted. Much to everybody's surprise, she grabbed the microphone and proceeded to blow us all away with her new role as a confident veteran reporter. And what was most amazing to me was this same girl not only got over her shyness that day, she went on to win the camp's annual award for Most Promising Filmmaker. It took me two months to fully recuperate And I'm certain my daily sessions of magenta breathing and visualizations played a significant part. During my Bell's Palsy episode, I swore I would never again take the little things like smiling for granted. One day I was smearing magenta liquid all over my face when I remembered that formerly shy little girl and couldn't help smiling. It was a sad, slightly sinister and droopy one but a smile nonetheless. You have been listening to Mad About Hugh, a bi-weekly summer podcast series written and narrated by color therapist Elaine Marie Sharp. Today's excerpts are from the book Mad About Hugh, a memoir in living color, available at AuraHouse.com. Please join me again for episode number three, Awakening to Color. Until then, don't forget to stop and enjoy the pretty colors. Bye.